Oh, I'm tired just listening to that. Um, so, uh, I, 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 uh, <clears throat> when I was really um, pleased to be asked and very happy, the only problem was the date, uh, very happy to, uh, to do this. And of course, Karen, Karen was a, a mentor of mine. She was just a fantastic woman. Uh, she, wasn't, she wasn't made a professor until quite late in her career, and there's whole stories around that um, issue. She, actually, her work lives on in the search engine of Google. Uh, she was a pioneer of information retrieval, and this is often forgotten. You know, this, uh, and women are often the hidden um, strength behind many of the big achievements in computing. So I think this is a really important lecture. And I, I came up, am I, is it my slide next? We've done those, haven't we? Yeah, so. Um, the, uh, I sent in, after a lot of pestering, I'm very bad at, um, uh, I say yes, I'll do things, and then I never come up with the title and the abstract. And I sent this in, and Ursula Martin emailed me back. She said, Wendy, you don't have to talk about women in computing. You can talk about what you do. But actually, I, you know, what you do in computing. And I, I, um, I always uh, say, and uh, as a lot of women in, um, in any uh, field of work say, you want to be promoted, you want to get all the honours and gongs for on merit. I don't want to be where I am just because I'm a woman. But I have been a woman in computing, and I have experienced that world as a woman. And that's what I, so I've developed this lecture where, and it's not, I've done it before, but this, where I sort of, I'll tell you my story as part of my, as I tell you about the work I've done. And uh, hopefully, um, we'll all get something out of that. I also love talking about myself, so that's fine. Which is why I'm always, uh, as I said to Paul earlier, uh, a media tart, and there you go. Um, so, uh, what else did I want to say? Now, there'll be other things that come up as we go along, I think. So, relax and enjoy. Uh, that's me. Um, I did this, uh, actually, I've always had an interest in problems, uh, the issues of memory and how computer can help people, enha help enhance people's memories. And I did put this slide together when we were talking about how increasingly in computers, as we go forward, um, your life is stored digitally, uh, whether you like it or not, and increasingly we'll like it or not. Um, but this, of course, my life wasn't. I was born in 1952, and I think uh, this in, in um, London, seven years after the Second World War, uh, my parents were both, when my father was 19, he went into the Air Force, he was a prisoner of war in Germany for five years. It's a lovely story, my mum was in the ATS and they were engaged just before he got shot down and didn't see each other for five years. He came back to um, the uh, UK on May the 8th, 1945, on VE Day, and they got married 16 days later. And that's what it was like in those days, and they were married for 62 years before he died of, with dementia. But... Um, they, I think my generation is a very blessed generation because um, we came out of, the, 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 the world was coming out of that war and I was born to parents who were very, very humble. My, my, that picture's taken in uh, my grandmother's garden in Walthamstow and behind it you can see bomb damage still left and very sort of um, uh, normal, humble roots, I hate that word, you know, just just ordinary people um, who'd never, nobody in my family had ever been to university. But as I and my brother came along, um, we had um, free education. I mean, I, I had free education from five to 24, five years old to 24, and free health service, and food, and uh, you know, coming out of the rationing from the war, we had plentiful supplies of everything and parents who just wanted us to do better than they had done. And of course, at this end of my career, I've, I've, I'm now in a position where I've, um, I've had a good job, I've got a house, I've got a pension, which the people coming after us are not going to have. So I really think that, that my generation is very blessed and we should be ever grateful. So, yeah, I also, another thing I say is choose your partner well. There's a picture of Pete in a minute, but that's me on my wedding day, which was the happiest day of my life. And um, uh, me with the Queen, oh, well, yes, that was when I got my CBE. And this is, this is me with Tony Blair. That was the first time I shook hands with the Prime Minister. Um, first time I met Tony Blair. And in fact, there's a story there in that we were in India and I had been in, I think, uh, I was a professor, but um, I just got my EPSLC Senior Fellowship, so it was 1996. 
or seven, when he just became prime minister around then, 1997-98. And it was an Anglo, -Ind it was a tour of India with him uh, as an Anglo-Indian collab let's, let's collaborate on science tour. And I nearly didn't go. Um, Pete and I went on holiday to Australia, and I was supposed to be coming back from Australia. We had booked our tickets, and the day the flight was going out to India, and I said, no, I can't, I can't do that. I just won't, you know, I won't be able to recover from that and go to India. And Pete said, no, you should, you'll be able to do it, let's do it. And that was one of the most, I met people on that tour who have helped me build my career. People who became chief scientific advisors, CEOs of companies. Um, it was a networking experience par excellence. And it's always, you know, seize the day has been a motto ever since. And here's another day um, when I met David Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with work. Uh, we met when well, we were on holiday in Greece, and that, anyway, it's a long story. But that, people often ask about that photo, and yes, he is lovely. <laughs> so I started out long, cut a long story short. I was good at maths at university, and uh, went off to do um, read maths, and uh, I rebelled a bit and wouldn't apply for Oxford or Cambridge. I had no idea if they'd let me in. I went to the the Red Brink on the south coast. Um, and uh, loved it. In fact, so it's in 1974, that's 40 years ago, and I'm still there. <laughs> uh, I, had, I did leave and come back again, but I'm, we're celebrating my 40th anniversary this summer. I'm holding a party for the whole university. Well, for the alumni. Who, uh, um, and uh, then they persuaded me to stay on and do a PhD in pure maths, and I just loved it. I love, I'm very happy in the abstract world, which is why I think I've never really enjoyed programming. Um, I much have, I mean, you can think of programming abstractly, of course, but I really, uh, I'm happier in n dimensions than in three. If you see me park a car, you'll know. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that's a bit stereotypical. So, uh, yeah, so here we are. This is uh, where I met Pete, and I always say, choose your partner well. That's what I meant to say earlier. Whether you're male or female, if you want to have a career in science, which involves a lot of late night working, we never, if you're in science and engineering, there's never an end to your job. There's always something else to do, another paper to write, another conference to go to, another student to supervise, another class to teach, another exam paper to mark. You never actually finish. And we're self-driven a lot. And we are, um, if, you're, if you're passionate about what you do and you want to get on, then your partner has to be very tolerant. Um, and uh, so I, I um, this, is, this was the 80s, and I... Uh, I couldn't get a job in pure mathematics. They're just the universities were contracting, and um, uh, I went off and taught in a couple of places teaching maths to engineers. There's lots of stories there. Like the first job I went interview I went for um, a temporary post at a university I won't name, and uh, a one year post teaching maths to engineers. And I walked into the interview, and there was a whole row of men, mostly professors. And this was a, I was, you know, I just finished my PhD. This was a one-year post to teach maths to engineers, and it was the days when you, um, when you had the interviews, you all sat in a room and waited for them to give you the answer. And the head of department came out and he offered the job to a man. Um, I'm in, uh, fine, but he's maybe better qualified than I am. I'd just got my PhD. And then he called me into his office. He said, Wendy, I'd really like to have given you the job, but the panel wouldn't give it to you because you're a woman. He said that to me. Although he could say that in those days. He could think it now, but he could say it in those days. This was... And the reason was that the rest, the panel, the, well, the engineering professors didn't think I could control a class of male engineers. And uh, the next week, I got a job teaching maths to engineers at Oxford Poly, as was then. And it was, well, there's stories about that, but it was fine, basically. And um, anyway, so in the 80s, um, I didn't want to do this type of teaching, maths teaching. I wanted to get into the research world. And all, but also, in the 80s, the personal computers came out. So the, uh, you will have your favorite one, the, the BBC B and the Sinclair Spectrum. And when I was, um, I was teaching at a teach training college, and it was about 1982, I think, and my boss said, Wendy, I want you to teach a course on, com on programming. I thought, oh, no. And he said, there's a Commodore PET in that cupboard. Take it home. <laughs> and so I took it home and taught myself basic. 
Um, and as Edgar Dijkster said, if your basic is your first programming language, you're mentally mutilated for life. <laughs> <laughs> and I am, right? I have never, I mean, I have taught, I have programmed and I have taught programming, but I've never really enjoyed it. And I've, so anyway, um, uh, but I do love, what I really got was the idea that you could use this, suddenly these computers became interactive and we could put pictures on them, graphics. And then I saw, one day I saw video on a computer from the analog video disks. Remember those, the laser disks? And it was the doomsday disk time. And uh, we were looking through one day and we saw a picture of my mother-in-law on the doomsday disk. Because all the kids, I don't know if you remember, had to send in pictures of their local village or school or town or whatever. A bit like Google could do today, but actually just a, three pictures from each school. And... Then, and um, uh, and I just got so excited by this. And uh, Southampton were advertising a lectureship, and um, I decided to apply for it, and I got it. And as you say, there were, I've never looked back since, really. I had done a, a master's at City, so I had a qualification in computing. Um, now, where does, uh, where does this man fit into my career, Earl Mountbatten of Burma? Um, here. This is me in his, this is in the library at Southampton in the archives, and this is Lord Mountbatten's archive um, in 1987. Quite a seminal year for me and the world. Not, um, one, of the, one of the small things was that um, his archive arrived at the University of Southampton. We became the custodians of the archive. And here it is. People say it's my shoe collection, but I do, I do, that is actually his archive. And there's me standing there uh, looking at a picture. So this is all pre, this is... We didn't conceive of a world then, born digital. This was out the, what we wanted to do was digitize, right? Take paper, take photos, full of lots of photos in this archive, lots of audio um, and some film. Uh, and the idea, I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic? I mean, people, instead of having to come and look through these boxes, they could actually look at this stuff on a, you know, we could send them a disc, was what you thought about in those days, or maybe even online. Um, we never did all of that because actually what defeated us, apart from the cost of digitising, it was about 250,000 pa papers, 50,000 photos, so not big as we think of multimedia archives on the web today, but um, it was the cost of digitising, but the copyright actually defeated us. We weren't allowed to make the material available online without lots of clearances. But um, we, uh, I had, in 1987... Other things that happened that year was that Apple released the Mac and they had this program on it called HyperCard. And it was the year of the first Hypertext conference. And I was suddenly into this world of, wow, not only can we have pictures, but we could use computers to link the pictures and the text and the text and the video. And, the, and, and I started you know, thinking of Hypertext and Hypermedia ways of act so this is what Paul said about I've always been interested in helping pe things make people make things easier and um, helping people access and find information so that was the sort of thing happening in 1987 um, and we built this system called microcosm which I won't go into but it was a people say it was a it was a precursor to the web it was a at the time there were lots of hypertext systems um, and we were pioneering a new type of hypertext system where the links were held separately. I don't think I've got a slide, no. The links were held separately from the documents. Um, and uh, I always remember, I'm not, I wasn't going to talk much about this, but when I first saw Tim demo the web, Tim Berners-Lee demo the web, I was aghast because he embedded his links in the documents, and I thought... God, that's such a bad way to do it. And not only that, they were only one way. And everybody knew hypertext links had to be two-way. <laughs> so, you know, our links could be two-way um, in the good Ted, Ted Nelson uh, genre, uh, but they were separate to the documents. And the idea was that the links were, um, they, you know, you had a, a beginning and an end, a source and an object and a destination, really, and a description. Uh, so they were triples. And the idea was that you could reason about the links. You could, so you could reason about why objects were connected. And actually, this, what it really was a precursor of was not the web, but the semantic web, right? Which was always part of Tim's original vision. 
the, the web of linked data. I had no idea that's what I was doing. The word web appeared in Van of our Bush's paper. The concept of linked data didn't exist, but we for sure were making links on data where most people are either embedding their links in the documents, like Tim, uh, using the SGML type uh, approach, or they were linking at the document to document level, but not at the data level. So our, we had the most fantastically rich hypertext, but it wasn't on the network. It, was, it ran on a PC, um, and we used to talk about a distributed version of it, but our focus was not making it available on the network, which of course Tim's was. And that's what multimedia looked like around that time. Right? It's now on our phones, on our tablets, and we can walk around the street accessing all the things that we were envisioning back then. And, but there's a laser disc around the corner somewhere. That was a microcosm workstation in those days. I've no idea if the phone was a sort of modem or whether it was just a phone, an office phone that was parked on the floppy disk. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, that was... Um, and look at the haircut. Anyway, um, so now around this time, this is all part of weaving the story of women in computing uh, into my career um, as a woman in computing. Because there are, so in 1987, I was working with Jill Lovegrove, who's another lady who's very well known in, in BCS circles, um, at Southampton, and we looked at the class list for October 1987. We had a, a, a almost a very new Bachelor of Computing. It was only, only been going, well, I think I arrived the year that the first lot graduated in 84. And uh, we realised that there were only about 20 people in the class in those days. <laughs> but we realised we had three years of undergraduate computer scientists with no women at all. None at all. And we thought, what are we doing wrong? Where, where have all the girls gone? So we started digging around, and um, uh, somebody, I don't know who it was, but Carol Goebel, who's another well-known lady in computing, was, part, was very much to do with it. Um, I don't know who started it. It was a mailing list. An email was quite new in those days called Women in Computing. And we had the first Women in Computing conference in Lancaster because we all said, have you got any women? Where are they, where are they all? Um, I'm feeling very vulnerable. I put that there because this is a, a word to the youngsters in the audience. I was doing this uh, multimedia work, as we were starting to call it in the 90s. And um, one of the professors at Southampton called me out in public in the coffee room one day and told me that there was no future for me either at Southampton or in computer science if I carried on with this type of work because it was not computer science. It was not writing compilers or writing designing programming languages or anything that we should be doing. And so he wanted me out, basically. Luckily, I won't tell you who that was, but I'll, this, I had the support of um, my head, the head of department, David Barron, who, uh, who um, saw that this was the future and uh, supported me to do it. And, um, you know, it was quite a difficult time because I really thought I should be doing something else with my life. But David um, mentored me through all that and uh, gave me the money to, because you know, I didn't have any grants and things in those days, gave me the money to go to conferences in the States uh, where this certainly was computer science. I also had a fantastic sabbatical at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor where multimedia certainly was computer science. And, and the other thing, the point to make here is um, that the WIC mailing list was abandoned. And this is because some men got onto it and started talking. It wasn't, it wasn't abusive or trolling or anything we might talk about today, but started talking about stuff we women didn't want to talk about. It wasn't actually very interesting. It was all about the details of maths, A-levels. And actually, we wanted to talk much di different type of... We wanted to talk about what it was like to be a woman in an all-male department and, and all this sort of stuff. And So I, um, uh, I'm a great believer in sometimes having just women-only networks, but generally speaking, I'm going to come back to the end to say this is not a women's issue. This is for everybody. So I started then um, thinking about women in computing, and I just put the stats up here. Jill and I, for our paper, looked at the um, UCA, as it was then, the, the, the how many men and women were applying for computer. And if I show you this, it's, I haven't bothered to update it because it's too complicated to work out what's computer science these days in, in the UCAS. But just going from, from 78, where um, computing was largely came out of maths departments, sometimes out of 
physics, electronics departments, but largely out of maths, and about a third of the class were women. I mean, there were quite a lot of women in computing in those days. There were many women in the industry running computing departments. And the figures for maths were about two to one um, men to women, and computing was about the same. So this is, see what happens here, where the government are putting lots of money into computing and growing. The courses were expanding hugely, uh, deliberate policy, and the number of men go up absolutely, and the number of women goes down both absolutely and relatively. Now, what happened here? 84, 85, 86? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, well, it was actually just, I mean, I say it's the personal computer, because there was actually very little you could do on, a per, on the personal computers when they first came out, except programming basic, or if you wanted to be more advanced, assembly language, and play Space Invaders. 